Um, we have Pavan, is that how you say your name? Pavan? Yeah, um, and Carl's going to be on video. They are going to talk about revolutionizing data backup and Kubernetes, unlocking the power of change block tracking with CSI. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, so we'll be speaking about our ongoing efforts to introduce like change block tracking to Kubernetes via CSI and how this can uh, greatly improve our backup strategies on Kubernetes. Uh, my co-speaker, Carl, couldn't be here today, so um, you know, he was gracious enough to record his part, so I'll be playing that uh, right after my part. Uh, it's going to be like a hybrid talk, so hopefully you find this talk insightful. Uh, so just some introduction, I'm Pawan. I, uh, I'm an engineering manager at Caston uh, by Veeam. Uh, my team and I focus on you know, finding creative solutions for data protection on Kubernetes. Uh, I'm also a maintainer of an open source project called Canister, uh, helps orchestrating data protection workflows on Kubernetes for Kubernetes applications. Uh, Carl is a colleague at Caston. Uh, he has extensive experience in uh, storage, distributed systems, and data protection. Uh, he's he's a he's an architect at Caston, and he's sort of uh, primarily focused on developing solutions for uh, block volumes on Kubernetes. So uh, just to get started, so over the last few years, uh, you know, the the adoption of Kubernetes to run stateful applications has uh, vastly increased. Uh, there are some reasons for this, and why folks are choosing to use Kubernetes to run stateful apps. Uh, so there, there is an increase in complexity of application. So if we see on the uh, on the other side there, uh, what we see on Kubernetes is just the top part of it. But underlying uh, that, there's like data services, storage systems, and actual physical storage running somewhere. Uh, what we see is just the top. And uh, Kubernetes has sort of, uh, uh, I guess, offer it offers like mechanisms to make sure there's high availability and scalability. Uh, features like you know, automatic failover, load balancing, predictable scaling. Uh, these things help meet data integrity and you know, the performance requirements for stateful applications. Uh, and there's also been like, great improvements in the uh, ecosystem. Uh, the adoption of you know, CSI to uh, provision storage or even tools like operators. They, they've uh, recently become very uh, convenient way to deploy databases and uh, other data in intensive applications. So uh, there was a survey recently, uh, maybe last year, I think, uh, by the data on Kubernetes community. So there were like 500 uh, Kubernetes users on that. And 90% uh, of them actually said that they think Kubernetes is ready for stateful applications. And 70% of them were actually using Kubernetes in production for deploying stateful applications. So there is a, a trend that shows that it's, uh, mo people are using Kubernetes more and more for stateful applications. Uh, and I, I think on the way here, I was actually reading you know, data dog report as well. There's over 40% of users actually deploy databases on Kubernetes. So, you know, we can see from that the trend is actually uh, improving and more adoption is uh, coming up, uh, towards stateful apps. So, uh, on Kubernetes, how exactly are stateful applications deployed? Like, uh, generally, we use stateful sets, daemon sets, or deployments. Mostly stateful sets, I would think. So, I just added that example there. Uh, to persist data, there's persistent volume and volume claim APIs that Kubernetes has. And uh, finally, the storage itself is provisioned using CSI drivers. Uh, CSI provides like a common interface for all uh, storage providers to uh, expose their APIs. Uh, on older versions of Kubernetes, there were entry plugins, but they are no longer supported. So uh, folks still use it on older versions, but not, no longer in support. So when we say stateful applications, uh, Protecting them definitely becomes the uh, highest priority. We need our data to be uh, always present and reliable. So 
uh, there was a working group that was formed in order to you know promote overall uh, support of data protection in kubernetes uh, you know identify missing features and functionality and finally collaborate on designing these features uh, it's called the data protection working group uh, it's sponsored by sig storage and sig apps but also collaborates with sig auth and sig arc and other uh, working groups uh, so there was a white paper that this group published uh, maybe a couple of years ago and that white paper mostly speaks about data protection uh, in in the white paper the a stateful app is sort of divided into two parts one is the application configuration and then there is application data itself so the, the configuration is mostly a set of kubernetes resources uh, stateful set something like sort of other you know yaml or json uh, specs that we deploy then there's application data itself this, this is found on persistent volumes mostly uh, managed by underlying storage systems now the definition of data protection actually says that you know it's a process of protecting both these components uh, on kubernetes and uh, the resulting uh, or the result or uh, output of this process is sort of called a backup now uh, depending on the application there could be different strategies that some uh, you know we can use to protect the data uh, but what level of protection is enough uh, do we just go with like storage uh, layer uh, backups or do we want the application to be aware of it uh, maybe quiesce the application before backing up something unquiesce after uh, you know there are some strategies that way and then there's uh, users that would need application mobility uh, between regions between clusters uh, various reasons there right cost optimization or i like we want to do uh, upgrades and stuff like that then there's uh, recovering from disasters uh, either on the same setup or a different cluster different region again uh, and some may want to clone their applications uh, just for like training or testing development purposes uh, there's also application versioning that's required some folks may want to recover older versions uh, provide backup compatibility um, sorry backwards compatibility and stuff like that they, and they may also want to um, you know retrieve a subset of resources when they are recovering and finally there's uh, the whole namespace based protection and also cluster level protection available so the white paper talks about all these things and uh, list some of the items that are already available in kubernetes today uh, we know that uh, csi introduced like volume snapshot apis uh, we can create uh, persistent vol uh, snapshots of persistent volumes or even recreate persistent volumes from existing snapshots then you have workload apis like stateful set deployments these will help with uh, uh, capturing all the kubernetes con configura uh, configuration then there is application crd uh, i don't think it's widely used but it's available and the white paper actually you know uh, focused on the missing blocks uh, on the right you see uh, that uh, volume backups repositories and stuff like that so most of these are actually in work there are different enhancement proposals going on right now to develop these features uh, but today we'll we'll just focus on uh, change block tracking and what or how it helps uh, us so what is change block tracking so it helps identify blocks that have changed or even uh, in use at the moment and uh, mostly in commercial backup systems these are used to uh, efficiently backup large block volumes now what was the motivation for change block tracking in kubernetes firstly we want to provide uh, you know efficient backup of block volumes uh, it's not feasible to always take copies of the entire volume there could be terabytes of data uh, so this also helps in uh, you know using of lower storage and uh, lower network utilization uh, when storing or transferring backups basically so uh, and it allows us to take more frequent and more reliable backups so instead of taking once in a year or once in a month we can enable like hourly or even faster backups so with chain block tracking it enables this and uh, so today uh, most storage providers 
already has uh, change block tracking support. Uh, it's just that they, they are not exposed to Kubernetes applications. Uh, CSI volume snapshots actually provide a way to you know, uh, back up entire volumes, but there's no standard API to uh, provide the change block. So the, these were the reasons why uh, we thought of introducing change block tracking into Kubernetes. And uh, the enhancement proposal 3314, you can find the links later, but uh, it mostly focuses on this. And how does this help users? Uh, so let's go through like two use cases here. Uh, if the users want to take full snapshot backup, uh, there's, there's like four steps that we can go through. With, with assuming that the CVT is available in Kubernetes, this is what would happen. So first we would create like a volume snapshot of whatever PVC uh, in block mode that we need to backup. Then uh, the application that is actually doing the backup queries the uh, new service that we would uh, introduce to identify all the allocated blocks on this snapshot. So this is a first snapshot. So there, there isn't anything to compare with. So it takes all the allocated bytes, uh, blocks basically, and uh, then uses that to store the backup. So finally, we actually, we can mount these volume uh, snapshots as uh, you know, PVs, PVCs uh, in, applica in, in a pod and then uh, take these blocks, whatever data blocks that we thought were allocated, we can uh, keep them stored somewhere. Uh, and how does this help in uh, incremental snapshots? Uh, the same thing would be repeated here, but instead of getting all the allocated blocks, we would actually take only the changes between the most recent snapshot that is already available and the current one that, uh, you know, we can mount that snapshot as a volume and then compare those two and finally store just the changes there. And the white paper actually provides a diagram for this. This is how the final solution would look. Uh, the application pod has a PVC and PV and somewhere uh, in the backend storage, the block disk is stored. Uh, so we use volume snapshot APIs to create a snapshot, maybe multiple ones. And finally, when taking a new snapshot, uh, we, the backup application would spin up like a data mover pod, mount the volume snapshot as a PVC, and then uh, call the differential snapshot or the CBT service to get the changes and just uh, store the changes in sort of some, some sort of uh, external storage. Uh, so uh, when was this kept introduced? It was, uh, it started back in June 2022. Uh, the first design was mostly to uh, using the CRD. So uh, the proposal was actually introducing a new CRD called uh, CBT CRD. And there would be a REST service to uh, ga gather data that's required, metadata in other words. So uh, get this change block data and store that in the CBT, uh, uh, CRD, uh, CR basically. So that uh, proposal was rejected by SIGARC and other folks from uh, the API server side, uh, mainly around security concerns and also like high load on that CD because we had to store the CRs. Uh, and then, uh, Later, uh, it was enhanced to change into uh, an aggregated API approach. So instead of storing CRs, uh, then we said we'll build those uh, responses on the on the fly, and it changed to an aggregated API mode. And again, that was rejected because uh, this was putting a lot of load on the API server when uh, actually building those responses, and it was directly proportional to the size of the response. So uh, that design was also rejected. And finally, uh, you know, the current design actually proposes a, a, CA, a gRPC service, both on the CSI side, on the Kubernetes side, with, uh, you know, session token uh, enforcement so that the security is maintained. And uh, this is right now awaiting SIG approval, but it's mostly like there are soft approvals and uh, the prototype is already being uh, implemented. So to go into this uh, design of this part, I'll actually play a video from Carl. He's one of the authors. Uh, let's see if this works. Is the audio playing?
haven't asked me to make this recording. As I don't know what's happening in your room, I'll read out each slide title as we proceed so that we can be in sync. This is the current design proposal slide. This is the third design iteration for this kit. This iteration has really been benefited from the work done before, which exposed various security issues that had to be addressed and highlighted the load that metadata retrieval places on the Kubernetes API server. This design iteration has two parts. The first is an extension to the CSI specification by adding a gRPC service to return snapshot metadata. KEP describes this extension, but there is a separate CSI PR with the gRPC specification. The second, which constitutes the bulk of this KEP, is how Kubernetes will implement this extension. The Kubernetes implementation adheres to existing patterns established for CSI drivers. The storage provider will deploy a container implementing the CSI API extension, and that container communicates with the Kubernetes sidecar container over a Unix domain socket. This shields the storage provider from Kubernetes. A Kubernetes backup application obtains snapshot metadata by connecting directly to the sidecar using a gRPC API. This is different from other CSI API interactions, which typically are done via Kubernetes object manipulation, for example, volume snapshot creation or dynamic provisioning of persistent volumes. Because of this direct connection, no snapshot metadata is passed through the Kubernetes API server. At the same time, standard Kubernetes mechanisms are used to authenticate and authorize the backup application. And in that sense, this is as secure as making a native Kubernetes API call. What this design does not address, it doesn't specify the format of the data that is written to the underlying persistent volume. The PV could be mounted in either block or file system volume mode. It doesn't provide an API to retrieve data blocks from the snapshot. Existing Kubernetes support must be used for this purpose for example, creating a volume for a snapshot and mounting it in a pod. Lastly, the scope of this design is restricted to block volume devices only. It does not address file shares like NFS volumes. In particular, it does not provide metadata on the files changed in network file shares. I'm on the proposed extension to the CSI specification slide. Let's briefly look at the salient features of this proposed extension. Details can be found in the CSI PR link at the bottom of the page. The extension is a new gRPC service called the Snapshot Metadata Service. It's an optional component and not every CSI driver will offer it. The service is intended to be accessed by a Kubernetes sidecar over a Unix domain socket, which follows standard patterns. The service defines two RPCs, get allocated and get delta. Get allocated returns a stream of metadata on the allocated blocks of a snapshot. Typically, this is used by a backup application in the first backup of a volume. Get delta returns a stream of metadata on the changes between two snapshots. And typically, this is used by a backup application to perform an incremental backup of that volume. Note that stream here is literally a gRPC stream, which is a pipe-like software construct that's used to retrieve an undefined number of data records. The metadata itself is expressed in one of two forms based on the current vendor implementation styles. That is either a series of change blocks, for example, used in EBIS Direct or Ceph, or a series of change extents, which is used, say, in VMware. A backup application has to be capable of handling both styles of metadata though this style will not change within any single call. I'm on the proposed implementation for Kubernetes slide. The design calls for the direct transfer of snapshot metadata from the Kubernetes sidecar to a backup application by passing the Kubernetes API server. It proposes a Kubernetes-specific variation of the CSI snapshot metadata service. This variant is called the Kubernetes Snapshot Metadata Service, as opposed to the CSI Snapshot Metadata Service. The sidecar will provide this service for backup application clients, and we'll get into more detail on this service on the next slide. 
A backup application will make a TLS gRPC call to the service after establishing trust to the server's CA certificate. A TLS implies one-way authentication only, but mutual authentication is achieved by requiring the application to provide a Kubernetes security token for the sidecar to authenticate. This token is obtained from the Kubernetes token request API, and it must embed the specific audience string needed by the sidecar. The sidecar authenticates the application security token using the Kubernetes token review API. It then authorizes the application's access to the snapshots concerned with the Kubernetes subject access review API. These checks make this direct gRPC connection as secure as any other call made to the Kubernetes API server. Sidecar then proxies the application's call to the real CSI service, translating IDs along the way and inserting any required secrets, as we'll see later. I'm on the Kubernetes snapshot metadata service slide. Why do we need a different API? Why wouldn't the CSI snapshot metadata API work? We look into the reasons behind this on this slide. The CSI service is designed to have exactly one client, a container orchestrator that communicates with it over a Unix domain socket. There are no provisions in the CSI API to distinguish between clients. In other words, while Kubernetes is a client of the CSI storage provisioner, Kubernetes clients are indistinguishable from Kubernetes itself. The Kubernetes API variant adds a security token field to each RPC that is used to identify the caller so that the sidecar can individually authorize and authenticate each request. The CSI API requires the sidecar to provide it with provisional specific secrets at runtime. Kubernetes applications may not have access to the secrets, so they are not required to be passed in the Kubernetes snapshot metadata API variant. Sidecar will fetch these and insert them in the call to the CSI service. The CSI service API follows CSI naming conventions, which are different from those used in Kubernetes. For example, snapshots are identified in Kubernetes by volume snapshot object specific name in a namespace, where in the CSI world, the same snapshot is identified by a single identifier strip. The Kubernetes variant of the API replaces the identifier properties with namespace and name properties. And lastly, having two APIs decouples the lifecycle of the Kubernetes implementation from the CSI specification. The Kubernetes snapshot metadata service will be published in the sidecar source code repository. So how do applications find a Kubernetes snapshot metadata service? During installation of the CSI driver, a snapshot metadata service custom resource will be created to advertise the sidecar's Kubernetes snapshot metadata service. There can be many such CRs in any given cluster, one per supporting CSI driver. And we look how they're going to be fetched in a later slide. I'm on the process overview slide. We'll now examine in detail the mechanism by which an application obtains snapshot metadata from a CSI driver. Don't be alarmed by this almost unreadable diagram. We will zoom in and dissect it in subsequent slides. I'm on the actor slide. There are four participants in this process. The backup application, which we assume has created a volume snapshot of the persistent volume that it wishes to backup. The Kubernetes API server. The community provided sidecar, which implements a Kubernetes snapshot metadata service and is the client of the CSI snapshot metadata service. And the storage provisioner provided CSI snapshot metadata service that communicates with the sidecar over Unix domain socket. I'm on the slide titled phases. The process can be broken into three distinct phases. In the first phase, the backup application client obtains the data needed to make the gRPC call to the appropriate sidecar. In the second phase, the sidecar authenticates and authorizes the backup application request. And in the third phase, the sidecar proxies the application RPC to the CSI service and returns the snapshot metadata to the backup application. We'll examine each phase in detail. I'm on the slide called Client Setup. 
The backup application first needs to determine the CSI driver name for the volume snapshot concern. There are multiple sources for this information. It can be obtained from the driver field of the volume snapshot class. Alternatively, the provisioner field of the storage class of the persistent volume has the same data. The backup application must search for the snapshot metadata service CR for the CSI driver. Recall that this CR advertises the existence of the Kubernetes snapshot metadata service hosted by the sidecar. The CR is created on installation of the CSI driver and has a label with the driver name to support an efficient query. It contains the Kubernetes snapshot metadata service CA certificate, its network address, and the Kubernetes security token audience string required by the sidecar. This audience string will vary between CSI drivers, and it can even vary between instances of the same driver installed in different clusters. So you have to look it up and not take it for granted. The application must obtain a Kubernetes audience scope security token. This can be done directly with the Kubernetes token request API, or indirectly with a projected service volume. I'll show an example of this indirect method later. The application must establish trust with the service CA prior to making any gRPC calls to support a TLS call to the Kubernetes snapshot metadata service. I'm on the slide called Sidecar Authentication and Authorization. The application passes the security token to the Sidecar in each RPC. The Sidecar uses the Kubernetes Token Review API to validate that token with the desired audience string. On successful validation, this API returns user information that can be used for authorization. The sidecar then uses the Kubernetes Subject Access API and this user information to verify that the caller has the authority to access volume snapshot objects in the specified namespace. I'm on the slide called Sidecar Proxy GRPC. The sidecar then loads the volume snapshot objects identified in the RPC and their related volume snapshot content objects. The latter objects provide the storage provision identifiers that are needed by the CSI API. The sidecar has to load the volume snapshot class to determine if any secrets are required by the storage provisioner and if there are any the secrets need to be loaded too. The sidecar then proxies the application's Kubernetes snapshot metadata RPC to the corresponding CSI snapshot metadata RPC, translating the IDs and inserting the storage provision secrets as needed. The CSI service fetches the snapshot metadata and returns it in a gRPC stream. The sidecar proxies the stream back through the Kubernetes snapshot metadata RPC stream. And that's how the whole process works. So uh, yeah, I think that that's pro most probably it. I we had like a couple of slides just to show an example of how the backup application would use it. Uh, so this is how the pod would look. Uh, it mounts the uh, volume device, which is the block block volume uh, PVC created from the snapshot itself, and also the service account that it obtained from the API server. So this is how uh, you know a backup application would. Uh, retrieve the change block data and finally store that. Uh, there, there are some references here. We'll share the slides. You can uh, go and look for more details on the cap and uh, all the uh, uh, you know white paper and other things that we have used here. Uh, so feel free to reach out uh, to us and we'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And you'll be around for a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Great. So people can. Find, uh, find them and ask some questions. Thank you.